I'm pleased to introduce our presenter for today's training, Brian Gettinger, PE. Brian is the Tumbling Services Leader for Freeze and Nichols Incorporated, providing technical and project leadership on tunnel projects across the organization. He has a wide variety of experience in design, cost estimating, inspection, and construction management of tunnels and grouting of shafts and reservoirs. His tunneling experience includes hard and soft rock tunnels excavated by conventional TBM, EBM, and drill and blast methods with tunnel liners, including cast in place concrete, precast gasketed concrete segments, and fiberglass pressure pipe. Brian is a registered civil engineer in the states of Texas, California, and Missouri, and is a graduate of the University of Missouri, Kansas City with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in business administration. Now let me call on Brian to give us his presentation on tunneling trending infrastructure tools for Texas urban centers. There we go, make sure I'm not muted. Um, let me pop the slideshow open. I want to make sure everyone can see that screen before we get started. Yeah, it looks good. All right. So I appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, I like doing these kind of presentations and working with people. So this uh, month apart has been harder for my extrovert side than maybe others, but I'm excited to get a chance to use this forum to share some thoughts on tunneling. I saw a few names on the attendee list that probably uh, know more about tunneling than I can. So you guys have to keep me honest today if I am getting off track. So getting started with an agenda. Um, introduce myself a little bit, talk about why people use tunnels in the first place, talk about differences between we'll call mega tunnels and micro tunnels, the two different ends of the spectrum. A little bit about risk management and then talk about some ongoing and upcoming projects in Texas. So a lot to get through. And this is going to be pretty much a high level overview of, of tunnels, um, provide some rules of thumb, um, but consider it an introductory course. So uh, opportunities to follow up in the future. So a little bit about me. Um, the one thing that you'll note if you've met me or know me is that I'm pretty easy to spot in a crowd. My wife jokes that I am a terrible, be a terrible spy because I'm very conspicuous. I'm six foot eight. I played basketball in college at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, I got three kids. We'll see if anyone, any of them make an appearance today during the call. Um, but a seven-year-old daughter, a four-year-old son, and a two-year-old daughter. Um, they were born in three different states. So I've been all, kind of all over the U.S. I was in Kansas City. I was in Ohio. I was in Kansas City again. I was in California. And I'm now I'm in Houston, Texas. And so I've been here since, uh, since Hurricane Harvey, essentially, almost three years, working on mostly tunnel projects with some dams as well. So let's first talk first about why tunnel projects come to, come to be. Um, if you look at the world and you look at hot spots where a lot of tunnels have been built, um, they generally have one thing in common, and that's a lot of people. So places like London, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, uh, Mexico City, San Francisco, New York City, Boston, um, a, a lot of the major metropolitan areas have tunnels. Um, some of those date back, you know, over 100 years in some cases, the London subway, New York City subway. Some of these things are, 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 are old infrastructure, been around a long time. But they have some things in common. And generally, population drives density. Density drives urban constraints, and urban constraints drives tunnel projects. Um, tunnels have the ability to minimize community impacts, environmental impacts. They can deal with challenging topography. Uh, in Houston, we don't have a lot of challenging topography. It's pretty flat, um, but and sometimes being really flat can be a problem as well. So it helps provide opportunities for gravity flow on the sewer project, or otherwise you couldn't get it because of the ground slope. And then obviously, if we're crossing a water body, um, going under a creek, going under a, you know even a bay, um, there's opportunities there. So I, I coined that you know tunnels are the skyscrapers of the underground. Um, they allow us to have high density development um, even in urban areas. So if it, they take nothing away from this talk at all today, I take away this is that tunneling is a feasible and cost effective alternative where urban constraints become an issue. Um, tunnels are not the easiest thing to build. 
They're not the cheapest thing to build. They're not the fastest thing to build in most cases, unless you have other constraints that are acting on the project that drive you to a tunnel solution. I kind of looked at it the way now that they're almost the option of last resort when everything else won't work. Um, the fascinating part is tunnels that advance to a point where they have a lot of uh, a lot of benefit. So where do we have tunnel projects? What kind of fields? Um, metropolitan transportation has, has been one of the primary. So you've got subway systems, um, London, Los Angeles, New York City, Boston, Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of the major subways um, all over the world are, have been tunneled with very large diameter tunnels and sometimes very low cover um, and, and soft ground and challenging soils. You've got interstate county tra country transportation. So um, one of the most famous ones in the United States is the Eisenhower Tunnel on I-70 in, in Colorado. Um, you got the Goddard Tunnel in Switzerland, um, the Alaskan Way Tunnel in Seattle, um, and then the Channel Tunnel crossing from the UK to France. Drainage, um, this has been one that's been big in Texas lately. Um, the project for the city of Dallas is under construction right now. Um, you've got the San Antonio River Tunnel, um, and you've got projects all over the world, including the Smart Tunnel in Malaysia, which actually is transportation and drainage. Wastewater. So uh, the most famous one in the U.S. is probably the TARP system in Chicago, Tunnel and Reservoir Plan. They've got over 100 miles of 30-foot diameter tunnel that uh, help them prevent combined sewer overflows. Uh, more recently, the DOA sewage system in Qatar, and then the Thames Tideway Project in London, some major sewer tunnel projects. Water supply. So uh, New York City is probably the most famous, um, well, I don't know, you could argue between the Los Angeles Aqueduct and New York City, but um, very deep, very uh, long water supply tunnels. Um, and then obviously the third one on that list, the Cal Water Fix Project is one that's being discussed. It seems like it might actually be starting to move forward um, in California to move water from north to south. And then last but not least, energy. Most cases, these tunnels are gonna be smaller diameter. Um, you've got, a lot of HDD projects um, in Texas, the Nueces Bay crossing was nearly two miles long. Um, and you've also not listed here, got some, some collider projects um, for physics and other things, but a lot of different project purposes um, can lead to a tunnel project. Here's a list of some notable ones that here in Texas, uh, the, the ones in black are existing projects and the ones in white are either under construction um, or will be in construction soon. So all over the state, we got different projects. You know, some of these are rock tunnels. Some of them are soft ground. Uh, generally, Dallas and Austin uh, are in are in rock. San Antonio's got a little bit of both, and then Houston. Unless you're going to put a tunnel 3,000 feet deep, it's going to be in soft ground. So, why is this an important topic now in the engineering industry? Um, Texas's population is growing dramatically. Um, a lot of people from the northern states have decided they don't want to be cold anymore in the winter. Um, they can have air conditioning in the summer to keep them, keep them cool here. So you've seen massive population growth, um, and those trends are expected to continue uh, through 2050. So Texas has large urban, urban centers already, um, Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin. Those are expected to get even bigger um, and get bigger faster. So looking at the county rank, Harris County and Fort Bend County, both are Houston metropolitan area counties, um, expected to grow from 4 million to almost 8 million. What's going to happen, and Texas is known for sprawling, but we're going to have a lot of urban density. Um, and so as we have those urban density projects, jobs that maybe in the past were open cut or just land clearing projects now have so many conflicts that they are going to move, move underground, both in the water, sewer, drainage, and transportation spaces. So I'm going to have a crash course on the why. Let's talk a little bit about what's the difference between a mega tunnel and a micro tunnel. Um, the industry has got a lot of different technologies that are available, and that is a blessing and a curse. It's, it's a challenge sometimes because it's very difficult to distinguish uh, for a layman what someone's talking about. And so I've tried to break that down a little bit in the next few slides. Um, hopefully, some, maybe some pointers you can take that, that'll just be helpful um, distinguishing one from the other. So we'll call it two buckets. We'll have a, a trenchless bucket and a tunneling bucket. So within the, within the trenchless bucket, there's two main categories. One is, you know, the horizontal directional drilling methodology, but, you know, best for long crossings and small diameters. And then you've got the other, which is the pipe jacking, auger boring, and micro tunneling bucket, which is um, generally less than 12 feet in diameter um, and generally less than 1,000 feet between shafts. Some of times for larger micro tunnels, you can go to 2,000 feet, but pretty common for road crossings, um, crossing small channels, um, 
generally very favorable for putting in gravity sewers where HDD is, is not. Um, but those are, we'll call trenchless. You go to the other side in blue, um, we'll talk about tunneling. Tunneling, you know, again, varies widely in diameter, you know, from six feet in diameter up to 60 feet in diameter. But there's two distinct methods there. One, we'll call it two pass or conventional, and then we'll call single pass or pressurized face. Um, and it's all about how the machine technology works and what kind of initial support systems installed. Uh, in rock, most commonly, you're gonna look at a two pass system. And in soft ground soils, most commonly, you're gonna look at a single pass system. But one important takeaway today is there's no hard and fast rule of thumb here. There's a lot of different shades of gray um, between different methodologies. So when I present stuff here about like this slide, which I try to break down just some general speaking, general speak on length and diameter. So um, what you're seeing here in blue is the general length between shafts for different technologies. So micro tunnels, uh, quarter mile to half a mile between shafts. Um, whereas with an earth pressure balance tunnel bore machine, you know, you could certainly build an earth pressure balance tunnel bore machine to go a quarter of a mile. You're not going to see it happen though because it's not very cost effective. So I said here, you know, one to two miles up to seven miles. Again, there's shades of gray on either side, but hopefully some tools like this can help um, both consultants and owners and engineers in general break down their options quicker and try to focus on a solution that will work um, because there are a lot of options and they're going to depend on how long is the alignment, how far apart are the shafts, what's your geology that you're in, and then how big a diameter does need to be. So all those factors kind of you kind of get thrown in a bucket and you, and you can shake it and see what comes out the bottom. And usually you have a couple different di different options for technology for a project. So there's some pictures um, here of different projects in, in Texas. Um, I, I noted before that, that Dallas and Austin have some pretty good rock. It's actually called the Austin Chalk in a lot of places. So uh, that picture on the upper right is the tunnel bore machine that's uh, getting ready to start mining um, in Dallas. 37 foot diameter, so I may believe it's the largest rock TBM active or, or in, in, in the most recent past here in, in the United States. Um, the Jollyville Tunnel was at a rock tunnel in Austin for water supply. On the bottom left is the San Antonio River Tunnel, um, which was a rock slash soil tunnel um, in San Antonio, built in the, in the 80s and 90s. And then finally, the North McGregor Storm Sewer Tunnel for the city of Houston, which was a uh, 12, 14 foot diameter earth pressure balance machine uh, for soft ground tunneling in Houston. So looking at those different cutter heads, uh, which is the cutter head is the front of the tunnel bore machine, you can see that the technology looks different, right? Um, on the Jollyville Tunnel in the upper left-hand corner, you see a whole bunch of uh, disc cutters. Um, you see a whole bunch of them on the, on the right-hand side, upper right from Mill Creek also. It's just a much larger diameter machine. Um, but in the bottom right-hand corner, you see a, a lot more open material, open face, and more of a scraping tools. That's because the bottom right is mining through clay, sandy clays, and the top are mining through hard rock. And those, those disc cutters are for breaking that rock up. So you'll see different technologies um, for different kind of ground conditions. Um, earth pressure balance tunnel bore machines are uh, one of the technology spaces that have had the most advances in the last 20 years. So uh, 20, 30 years ago, this would have been pretty cutting edge, very, I would say, high risk to use on a project. Um, but we've seen opportunities in the States and, up, and around the world for this technology up to in the 50 foot diameter range and some very challenging conditions under sea crossings even. Um, and they've been very successful. Um, it's called an earth pressure balance machine because it balances the pressure between the machine and the earth and water pressure outside of it to prevent um, settlement from groundwater or soil intrusion. It also prevents heave from pushing up too much. Uh, I could explain this, but it, it's difficult to explain a complicated system besides looking at the picture. I encourage you guys to Google um, earth pressure balance tunnel bore machine on YouTube. And there's some great videos by Heron Connect and, and the manufacturer on that. So where do you use a earth pressure balance tunnel bore machine? And where do you use different methodologies? It's all about the um, grain size distribution chart. Um, earth pressure balance tunnel bore machines work best for fine grain soils. So your clays and your silts and even fine sand. Um, other technologies for pressurized face tunnels work better where you've got coarse grain soils. So if you have a lot of gravel or, or coarse sands, um, they work better. It's all about how the technology provides the pressure to the face. Uh, a slurry TBM uses just what it says, a slurry um, that it recirculates 
to provide pressure, whereas an earth pressure balance machine uses a long screw conveyor um, that's, that controls the discharge rate to provide pressure. Uh, so some, some good examples here that we use on a recent project um, that we worked on for Harris County Flood Control District on just kind of what's, what different technology is uh, available. All right, so now you're digging the tunnel and, and how are you gonna support it, right? Um, in some cases, the ground is essentially self-supporting. So you've got like the upper left-hand corner. Uh, if you're in good rock, this is from the Mill Creek Tunnel in Dallas. You've got some great rock, it's essentially self-supporting. You see some bolts there at the top, those little black things are bolts. Um, but for the most part, that ground's gonna stand up on its own. If you have that situation, that's fantastic. Um, your tunnel's gonna cost less because it's less complicated to support and excavate, but that's not always the case. Um, you see a lot of projects that have, like the middle here, if you're doing road crossings, um, you're jacking a, a, a casing for hand mining or something like that, you're putting steel liner plate in beside you, behind it, um, or the upper right-hand corner, maybe a little longer tunnel, you're putting in hardwood lagging and steel ribs to support the ground. If you're using other methodologies, uh, putting in a cavern or some other underground structure that's maybe not circular, you can see shotcrete steel reinforcing, which is the bottom left. And then if you're using a pressurized phase tunnel boring machine, you actually never see the ground at all once you're in the, once you're mining. Um, so you're going to have precast concrete segments installed immediately behind the cutter head um, that are going to allow you to provide that pressurized phase. Um, so when you get done, the tunnel machine goes by, you have a tunnel that's complete. So it's a one pass, right? These other instances, whether it's uh, the rock, the hardwood lag, your steel liner plate, or shotcrete, you're going to go back and probably put a cast in place concrete or a pipe lining inside of it. Here's some options. Here, those just discussing different kinds of liners. So, cast in place concrete, you're generally going to see that in an over eight foot diameter uh, range. So, usually using telescoping forms, um, able to put in some pretty large diameter tunnels that way. Most of the tunnels in Chicago, which are 30 foot diameter, were put in with cast in place concrete. Fiberglass pipe works great for sewer projects, great corrosion protection. Uh, it's, it's put in a two pass for a conventional tunnel. It's also sometimes jacked. Um, so if you're doing a micro tunnel, you can jack fiberglass pipe as well. Um, sometimes people jack the steel casing, but in many cases you can jack the fiberglass pipe without a casing, unless you're required to, if you're crossing a railroad track or some other easement that requires it. Um, but you can jack that fiberglass pipe and does, that does a nice job up to about 12 foot diameter. Um, steel pipe, you can put it in in sections. You can jack it as uh, lengths to 20 to 40 feet long. Um, a lot of options with steel for initial support and then final actually as a final pipe product for you know water conveyance pipes. In some cases, bare rock works. Um, if you have a rock, uh, a limestone, for example, that's got very high rock quality designation, um, it's, it's strong, not you know not a lot of fractures. It's, common, it's not actually uncommon to have tunnels that are unlined. This is a photo from San Francisco area, uh, for the mountain tunnel, it's a uh, water supply project. And that tunnel was installed with no lining and it performed very well for a long time. They're actually going back and rehabilitating it now, but you don't actually have to line a tunnel. Consider that the rock you're removing might be 10,000 PSI, compressive strength, and the concrete you're gonna put back in for the liner might be 4,000 PSI. So sometimes in certain circumstances, not lining the tunnel is a better solution. We talked about precast segments. Um, one limitation that's important to note is segments really are only available, we'll say nine foot diameter and larger, so 108 inch and bigger. Um, so you have to consider what your, what your diameter is. And then concrete pipe, which you can, you can jack up to 12 foot diameter. So urban shaft sites, um, a couple of these were ones that I, I had a chance to spend a couple of years of my life on in Columbus, Ohio. Um, you can put a shaft site on a pretty small piece of property. Um, I, I'd say for a large amber tunnel, you're gonna want at least an acre. Um, and for your launch shaft, you need to have at least two acres. You know, if you give the contractor 20 acres, he's gonna be happiest. Um, but what you want to do is avoid having such a tight space that you limit his um, operational flexibility, his ability to move material around. If you do that, it's going to cost you money um, because he's going to have to double handle material. It makes his logistics a lot more complicated. But the, I guess the important point from this slide is you can put a shaft uh, very close to things. Um, the upper left-hand corner of that building is actually a law firm. I don't necessarily suggest putting a shaft next to a law firm um, just for the odds of getting sued go up. But in that case, it worked out okay. So. Um, near buildings, near um, residential structures even, sound walls are pretty common to try to prevent uh, noise from being, being an issue, um, but you can fit shafts in pretty small spaces. 
if you are going to launch a portal, um, which is very common on your transportation projects, um, the space requirement is a little bit different, right? You need a, long, a very long linear area. Um, you need to be able to excavate that down, support the, the slope, and consider a tunnel bore machine. A you know, 20 foot diameter tunnel bore machine is probably at least 300 feet long. And so you're gonna need a very long area uh, to ramp down and get down underneath there if you're doing a subway or, or a, a road project. If you're big and digging a shaft, some, some options on how you get down to the underground. Um, obviously the ground has to be supported. Some of these tunnels are uh, 30 feet deep and some of them are 300 feet deep. Um, the depth obviously affects some of the, some of the technology. Uh, one of the big, fa two big factors for shafts are groundwater, how permeable the soil is, um, and then what kind of soil. Is the soil going to be stable and stand up, or is it going to want to flow? If it wants to flow, then you're stuck with secant piles or sheet piles or diaphragm walls, something you can pre-install or maybe even a case on. If it will stand up a little bit, you can use other methodologies like a liner plate with ring beams, um, soldier, soldier piles and lagging ways to support the ground that, that does not have required to stand up for a few minutes before you sink it down there. I think on the bottom right, caissons I think are my are the, one of the cooler ones. That essentially you, you pour concrete or you use concrete segments and then you will use the weight of that, of that to sink it into the ground as you excavate inside. Just gotta be sure you don't, it doesn't sink too effectively and then get away from you in the ground. So there was a very fast crash course on tunnels, larger diameter tunnels. Um, I can talk fast and I can talk about tunnels for a long time. So hopefully I'll have a few minutes for questions at the end, but I want to shift over or touch a lot of topics today and talk about trenchless technology. So let's look at trenchless as, a, as if it was an umbrella. Um, you know, you hear people talk about micro tunneling, but what they're, they're not necessarily talking about using a pressurized face micro tunneling machine. They're talking about using an, a pipe jacking machine with open face. So there's a lot of, um, misuse of terms, right? The, the P1 thing means something else. So it's, it's very important to clarify, particularly when we're, if we're providing guidance to contractors through specifications and drawings, exactly what you mean. So trenchless is an umbrella. Underneath that umbrella, there's a lot of different methods. Um, and they're all, again, what's your project's diameter? How long is it? What's the ground conditions? What kind of pipe do you need to install in it? Um, there's a lot of different considerations for what the best method is for a project. And oftentimes, in the early phases of a project, you know, the, and the concept and preliminary design level, we're, this is something we're doing as a, as a deliverable to the, to the client and say, okay, this is the methodology or methodologies that make sense to recommend to go forward. So, trenchless for new infrastructure, um, I think it's important to distinguish that. There's a whole different trenchless tre technology um, wing of the industry that does rehabilitation. Um, we're not talking about that today. We're talking about new infrastructure. So, it's all new pipes, um, same kind of deal length between shafts at the top and diameter range at the bottom. So most of your <clears throat> trenchless stuff is going to be a thousand feet and less, except for your HDD um, and direct pipe, which is sort of like HDD and micro tunnels together. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, diameters, generally speaking, 24 to 36 inch up to 10 feet in diameter. Um, some stuff can be smaller. You know, there's some things that can get a little bit larger, maybe up to 15 foot diameter for some micro tunnels. In micro tunnels, you're mostly jacking pipe. Consider that pipe has to get shipped to the site. And so if you have over a 12 foot diameter pipe, A, it's hard to find someone to make that, and B, it's very hard to transport it. Um, so something to consider there. Some of these are steerable. Some of these can do curves. Generally speaking, micro tunnels are, in the United States have been a, it's an application, but there's a lot of evidence, um, opportunity to do things um, really hasn't been explored a whole lot in the United States to date. Um, some of them are more effective for cohesive clay soil. Some, some will even work in rock. Uh, although I will say that the rock applications often are not able to go as far as they are in, for soil applications because of the di different ground conditions. And the next piece is, you know, what initial, su initial support systems for trenchless, um, you know, steel casing pipes are probably the most common kind of initial support system, um, but they aren't necessarily required in all cases. I talked about Hobos um, or Floatite, other, other jackable fiberglass pipes uh, that can be used. Um, in, in other applications, if you're doing hand tunneling, right, you can use liner plates, ribs and ribs and boards, um, sometimes even uh, bolts and shotcrete, depending on the, the ground conditions, if you're in a competent rock. Um, so most people default to steel pipe. 
I think one thing I would ask people to consider is that, do I really need a steel casing pipe for this project? If it's a gravity sewer, it's not under pressure, um, you're not crossing a utility that requires a casing pipe, you know, you might just be including it and increasing the cost of the project unnecessarily. So there are certain applications where it makes sense, but it isn't, it shouldn't be used in, in all cases as a blanket, uh, blanket rule. Some photos of microtunneling, you know, these are smaller shafts, you know, depending on how deep they are, sometimes they're, they're rectangular in shape. Um, for a jacking purpose, you want to be able to jack a long piece of pipe. And so your jacking side is maybe 20, 30 feet long if you can. Um, so if say, you could jack a, say, a 20 foot stick of steel casing pipe. Um, and your retrieval side is shorter, right? It doesn't need to be nearly as large. So the acre rule that applies to the large amber tunnels doesn't, doesn't necessarily apply to micro tunnels. Sometimes you see these being done in, in you know, one lane, one 12 to 12 foot wide roadway lane on, on the road. So uh, the smaller the shaft, space, the more it's going to cost, right? Just because it's more challenging logistics. And if you do have a really small shaft site space, it's important that you provide the contractor some space nearby that he can, he can put his stuff um, because you can't do all your work from one lane of traffic, right? So you got to have ability to kind of to move materials in and out, particularly staging areas for pipe. Um, this is a big deal for HDD, right? Where is he going to have his pullback? How can he do that? How can he set that up? Major considerations in the planning process that, that tie into feasibility. Couple more photos uh, for micro tunnels. Now, this is a industry that's you know, used already a lot in in Texas. I'd say that the bigger tunnels are a little bit more unknown for Texas, but there's a lot of a lot of contractors, engineers, and folks doing micro tunnel projects, or we'll say trenchless in general. Um, you know, in Houston, um, water conveyance lines, a lot of hand mining is being done. Um, and there, you know, the, there's a new pipeline going all the way across the city, 39 miles, gonna have a lot of trenchless sections on that project as well. So a lot of people make microtunneling equipment. Um, this one's a photo from, from Heron Connect. Uh, this is a pressurized face slurry microtunneling machine. Um, again, great opportunities on YouTube for some, some videos that can, that can show how these parts all move and, and operate together. Um, the item on the right, that's an interesting point to bring up. So this is an interjack station. So these are um, intermediate jacking stations that are installed within the pipe string, right? Between two, say, steel casing pipes um, that allow you to provide the thrust, not just from the launch shaft, but actually out in the excavation. Uh, that is critically important because one of the biggest challenges of the micro tunnels is getting stuck, right? We don't want to get our micro tunnel 400 feet into an 800 foot drive and get stuck. Because what happens is you have to put a shaft down to rescue that machine potentially. And if you had 800 feet between your shafts, that means you didn't want to have one in the middle, right? So how can we avoid that? Um, a lot of times machines get stuck because they get bound up. They're, they can't thrust anymore. They're going to buckle their pipes. The interject station allows you to provide thrust within the pipe string, right? So you push from the back, collapse the interject station, and then the interject station actually pushes from the middle of the string and allows you to uh, provide thrust forward, essentially splitting your force in half. Now, the problem with the interject station is you only can install it when your pipe string is being installed. So you have to install it before you know that you need it. So it, it really is a risk management exercise to say, hey, let's install this interject station. That way, if we need it, we have the ability to, to exercise it later. So for long micro tunnels, sometimes we'll, we'll say, hey, when you won't, either once you put half of your pipe string in, we want you to put in an interjack station, or once you hit 80% of your theoretical maximum jacking force, we want you to put an interjack station in, just to make sure that you're not going to end up with a situation where you're going to get stuck or, or potentially buckle the pipe. A whole other different field from microtunneling is, is horizontal directional drilling. Um, you know, the biggest deals on HDD, I think for consideration is sometimes you'll see folks try to consider these for gravity sewers. And there's some papers out there that say that they do work for gravity sewers. Um, it would not be my first choice. Um, they've made amazing advances in the ability to, to steer these things, but it's not as reliable as a, a laser guided microtelling piece of equipment is. So there's five different segments. You have an entry tangent, an entry curve, a bottom tangent, an exit curve, and an exit tangent. And depending on how long, how deep, these things are, those, those numbers are gonna change, but they all have those five different pieces. Um, the big thing on HDD is what's my curve radius, right? Sometimes HDD actually won't work for a crossing if it's too short. 
because you can't make the curve radius work. If you're going under a, a deep-ish river crossing with relatively high banks, it can be hard to do that over a short distance because you can't make the curves. So uh, for steel pipe, generally the curve radius, for rule of thumb, 100 feet per inch of diameter. So it makes a 3,000 foot radius. If you're using plastic pipe, you can do a lot tighter radius, right down to 625 feet for the same 30 inch pipe. But there's a caveat. That means that the drill stem has to be able to make that curve. And, it, and that doesn't always work out that tight. Um, so this is, a, at least personally, something we always go out and, and talk to contractors about, what their equipment capabilities are. Um, and even in the planning stages for projects, to understand you know, we don't want to get to a point where we bid out a contract that isn't constructible with the methods, right? Because to having to go back and get additional easements after the job has been, been bid out for construction is something no one wants to have to do. So um, those are the rules of thumb on the radius, but something I definitely would encourage going out and asking questions about. Obviously, HDD is a multi-pass system. So we're going to drill a pilot hole. We're going to put a reamer on the other side. We're going to pull it back. And then we're going to pull back um, the pipe. So multiple passes. Um, you can put steel pipe. You can put in plastic pipe. Um, and you can do these up to pretty large diameter. Um, if you look at some of the publications for the industry, um, you know, 48-inch diameter uh, is within the realm of possibility. Um, it's much more common in smaller diameters. You see it a lot for telecommunication stuff um, or, and a lot more in the 24-inch and smaller diameter range. And some, some very long, long crossings are possible. Um, it's possible to recover these things out in the water for wet recovery. Um, there's a lot of different variations. Um, and obviously we're going through things at a high level today, but there's, there's some pretty cool technology, things that, that you might not think are possible that actually are um, with both HUD and some of the other trenchless technologies. So a couple photos of, of pilot hole rimming and pullback. One thing to note on the right side on that pullback, you notice all those cranes out there holding that pipe. Um, that's to keep the pipe from buckling. And so when you think about your entry angle and exit angle, on your HCD crossings. If it's a steep angle, um, that pipe's gonna come out of the ground and it's gonna start getting pretty high pretty fast as you get away from the, from the entry. Uh, that means those cranes gotta be pretty big. And so that starts becoming a logistics question of where do I fit that stuff? And then also a cost question. So uh, again, considerations into how you plan um, an HDD crossing. The last one we're gonna talk about is micro tunneling. If, if microtunneling and HDD had a child, uh, it would be a direct pipe project. So direct pipe essentially puts a mic microtunnel cutter head, slurry machine cutter head on the front end of an HDD pipe thruster. And it's a single pass, so there's no pullback. Um, these are, are kind of a, a niche market where HDD isn't a great solution and it's too long to microtunnel it. Um, that this, that this can work. So generally for longer crossings, you know, bigger than 36 inch diameter, um, go back, going back to that, that figure I showed, we had it on there for, you know, 24 to 60 inch diameter, you know, a thousand to 7,000 feet. Um, it, it can go a long way. Uh, again, the smaller diameters sometimes limit your length, right? Equipment can only get so small. It continues to get smaller over the years, but it can only get so small. So sometimes on the smaller diameter side, you can't go 7,000 feet, whereas a 48 inch, you can go further. Uh, that applies to microtunneling as well. Microtunnel that's 84 inch diameter can go a lot further than one that's 24 inch diameter. Uh, just the ability to thrust and, and push that pipe. All right, a few more planning considerations on projects. So this is a photo um, from Singapore. Um, Singapore is one of your poster childs for having a lot of tunnels. Um, they've got tunnels for about everything there. And the reason they have that is because the land space is so limited on the island. Um, so population and infrastructure drives tunnel projects. When you build tunnel projects, they then drive density. Anyone that's been uh, to Washington, D.C., San Francisco, New York City knows that at the stations, right, there's a lot of infrastructure. They're building a lot of multi-use development there. We've got residential and commercial right there at the transportation systems because nobody wants to drive across the Bay Bridge from Oakland to San Francisco. They'd rather take the subway, right? And they'd rather not to drive to get to the subway. So if they can live right there, um, it's great. So it tends to drive density. Just like you can stack buildings, floors on a building, you can stack tunnels. Now, you're not gonna stack them bottom to top, right? They're gonna have to have space in between, but there's no reason within the same right-of-way you can't have tunnels at different depths. 
Um, and it's a geotechnical analysis to determine what the different depths are between the tunnels, whether it's in rock or soil. Um, but we have the ability to go vertical and install higher density um, utility, transportation, uh, infrastructure. So wastewater consolidation. Um, tunnels have been used extensively across the United States on combined sewer projects. Um, I spent a couple of years in Columbus, Ohio. These are two photos from that project, the Ores CSO tunnel. And we don't have necessarily have CSO issues as bad in Texas as we have, have, we has, have SSO issues, sanitary sewer overflows, but the systems function similarly during wet weather events. And so the tunnels allow you to have a side spill function on existing interceptor systems that it spills down into a tunnel instead of out into a waterway. So the tunnel acts as the overflow. It provides both conveyance and storage, gets the water to the wastewater treatment facilities, you know, eliminating those overflow events. Um, so you've seen these in Columbus, Indianapolis, uh, Detroit, St. Louis, um, essentially all over the mid, you know, Cleveland, um, Cincinnati, all over the Midwest, um, and Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and any, any of the cities that have the CSO systems, um, and Chicago's the poster child of the 100 miles of this, um, they've used tunnels to, to alleviate challenges with, with stormwater and combined sewer drainage. So big, big opportunities for wastewater side. Um, it allows poorly draining areas because of limited slope to outfall into a tunnel that can provide gravity flow to a centralized uh, treatment plant. So, this, so in Chicago, the Stickney plant, um, which is one of the biggest in the world, essentially everything drains to it and has a gigantic lift station at one place that can pump that out. Um, that gives them opportunities to install things like phosphorus removal, other systems that don't work well if you have 50 lift stations, but work a lot better if you have one big one. So uh, it definitely facilitates wastewater consolidation. Um, rod optimization and structures. Um, this is really important. Sometimes I'll see things on early action projects where a tunnel is going to have a bunch of right hand turns at intersections. Um, that certainly can be done, but it's going to mean there's a lot of shafts. It's not going to be very efficient. So when we're looking at a large diameter tunnel, we want to start at a planning level with about a thousand foot curve radius. Um, and some of the larger tunnels can go a long way between shafts. We go back to that figure we talked about earlier, you know, three to seven miles between shafts is a long way. And so you, you don't necessarily have to have a shaft. Um, you know, some of the folks have pointed to, to some of the uh, guidance provided by the uh, state of Texas that says, hey, you need to have a shaft every time there's a, a change in direction for a manhole. Um, but that's, that's if you have an abrupt change of direction. If you have a curve, a smooth curve, a thousand foot radius, that, that, that does not apply. Um, so opportunities exist to go a long way, which means you don't have to put a shaft in places where you don't want to have a shaft. So you can, you can, you can definitely find better locations for them. You also realize cost advantages. Long tunnels with fewer shafts are going to cost less on a per foot basis than shorter tunnels with more shafts. Shafts are a fixed cost and the variable cost of the tunnel gets spread out over a longer distance on large projects. So if we can maximize the length of tunnel drives to reduce the cost per foot, that gets us more bang for a buck on a project. Uh, tunnel profiles, unless you're talking transportation or you're talking kind of a gravity sewer, um, you have some flexibility. If it's a water line, if it's an inverted siphon, you can go, the inverted siphon hydraulics don't, doesn't matter if it's 50 feet deep or 300 feet deep. Uh, this is a profile from the uh, tunnel in Dallas, uh, Mill Creek Tunnel. Um, the depth of that was driven by where could they find the most consistent and favorable geology to mine in? Because when they found that consistent favorable geology, it costs a lot less to mine in it, right? The tunnel was a lot simpler to construct, um, therefore it cost less. And so they had a very favorable price for five miles of tunnel. Uh, whereas if they had tried to put it a hundred feet closer to the surface, it would might've cost a lot more money to build. So find consistent geology, you know, try to find at least two diameters of cover. Sometimes we'll see projects that, you know, we want to put a 10 foot diameter tunnel, uh, four feet be below um, the road, certainly possible. They've done much bigger tunnels and subways, well, w uh, very close to other infrastructure. It increases your risk of challenges um, for settlement, for heave, uh, for damage to the infrastructure of the surface. Um, the more cover we can provide, the less that damage, um, chance of that damage happening. I'm not a geotechnical engineer. I'm not going to masquerade as one, um, but those guys will tell you that you know, the, the soil, soil characteristics as a big driver for that, um, or rock characteristics are big drivers for those, but trying to get more space between things is a good thing. All right, 
Subterrain and easements. So subterrain easements are an interesting aspect to tunnel projects. We have to think about um, a tunnel doesn't affect the surface. So we don't have to buy a surface easement. We don't have to buy utility easement at the surface necessarily. What you can buy in a tunnel is a subterrain easement. That allows you to buy an underground box that cannot be penetrated in the future. In most cases, the tunnel's deep. That underground box doesn't change the future development of that property. Um, because you know, in Houston, most of your friction piles are going to be 75 feet deep. Um, so a tunnel that's 150 feet deep, you can still put a 75 foot deep friction pile on top of it as long as the pile doesn't penetrate the box. And so subterranean easements are a lot easier to obtain. They cost less. Um, it allows you to cro cross private property easier. Um, I don't necessarily advocate putting tunnels under structures. There's no reason you cannot but perception is reality of some people and you don't want it, the perception that their house is going to fall into a tunnel. Um, I don't know if there's, that's ever happened to my knowledge, but if it's a perception, right? So we don't want to necessarily go under structures, but it allows you to cross private property this way. Um, a lot easier than getting an easement at the, for utility or permanent easement at the surface. Um, diameter standardization real quickly, you know, tunnels, if you change the diameter from eight feet to 12 feet, in most instances, that means you need a new tunnel bore machine. And so that means that Condor now has mobilized two different machines for the same project. Um, so anywhere we can standardize the diameter, we're going to save ourselves cost. Um, so a lot of times in a wastewater master plan, for example, they're going to say, hey, you know, I need, I need a 48-inch piece here, and then next mile I need a 60-inch, next mile I need an 84-inch. Again, certainly constructible, but the bigger packet sizes, you know, two miles and longer is great, and trying to standardize the diam diameters, Really, we're going to bring down our project cost and save the owner's money in the long run. And then, just for consideration, why is this tunnel diameter so much larger than the final pipe? Well, sometimes we only need a 36-inch sewer, but we have to make the 36-inch sewer so long that we have to put in a larger pipe to, to build it. The tunnel technology to build that 36-inch sewer might not be able to go as far as the, as the river crossing. So, in this case, there's a lot of excess capacity in that tunnel that wasn't used. Now, it's not bad. It's just could, they could install a 54-inch pipe or a 60-inch pipe or even a 72-inch pipe in here for incrementally more cost, not much more cost, um, and maybe got more bang for their buck. They didn't need to. They only went for 36. But sometimes we need to consider the methods that are required for tunneling to put in what we need to put in. And in some cases, you know, a 10,000-foot-long tunnel, 36-inch diameter under a river or something like that, hey, we can't do that. 36 inches, you're going to have to do bigger. And so all the opportunities to provide the, the owners more benefit in those situations. All right, so we got 15 minutes left, probably maybe 10 minutes left of questions. So tunnel is all about, tunneling is all about risk management. Um, surface infrastructure, and even in some cases, infrastructure that is uh, near surface is easier. Um, surface conditions are more well known. Construction is complicated, but the constraints are simple. It's easier to work around delays. Tunnels are linear projects with sometimes very little information about the ground conditions. Um, the process is very repetitive, um, but you've got very complicated constraints and a very long critical path without a lot, a lot of workarounds. Um, so there's different risks and consequences, therefore different contract tools. So one thing, um, we had some time to talk with other engineers about this, and we've kind of developed these points which I thought were worth sharing with others. Um, Contractors don't accept risk, they price it. So when we talk about using geotechnical baseline reports um, as a risk management tool, uh, the old industry practice is to say, oh, contractor, go figure it out, right? I need a 60 inch tunnel, it needs to be two miles, or it needs to be one mile long, you figure out how to build it, you figure out the ground conditions, you do all those things, um, you take the risk, right? And contractors will do that, they'll take the risk, but they're gonna make you pay for it. And so I think there's an opportunity to provide an equitable risk sharing not in the sense that the owner is going to absorb risk, but he's going to just be honest about what the ground conditions are and describe them the best way he can and then set baselines to say what the owner will pay for and what the contractor will pay for if those conditions are different. Because um, ever owners want the lowest cost, right? They don't, and they want the fewest claims. Um, and contractors understand that there's going to be changes on projects, right? So we seem to have an equitable way to, to uh, mitigate those things during construction. Risk management is an iterative process. It's not a one-time thing. You don't do it during design and leave it, right? Identify the risk, you evaluate it, then you find ways to mitigate, allocate, or avoid those risks. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been around the industry long enough that I'm pretty apparent that the more things that you've seen, right, 
the better risk manager you can be, right? If you haven't seen something happen that goes bad, you don't know it can go bad. Uh, I've had the, the pleasure, I guess, to be on some products that had challenges, and I've learned a lot more on those projects than otherwise because things went wrong, right? So now we, we understand what could go wrong in the next project and how we can mitigate those things next time. So people that have been doing projects like the ones you are working on or planning, those are the people you want working on them because they, they can help you mitigate those risks. Risk classification, you know, white is good, red is bad. Um, it's important not only to, to work on risks that are high likelihood, right, that they're likely to happen, but also risks that are high consequence, right? So what, you know, what, what's the life safety risk? What, what's the risk of someone, someone could die in the project? Yeah, it's unlikely to happen, right? But we need to have a, a contingency plan in there to make sure it doesn't happen. Because even if it's low likelihood or improbable even, if it's a five consequence, it's a high consequence risk, we need to have a way to mitigate that. So it's a, it's a good, way, good tool to use and, and you know, you mitigate the red ones first. If you have time, you mitigate the yellow ones and then leave the white ones alone. They're not causing enough trouble. Um, we could do a whole seminar on baseline reports. Um, I just will say that, that, in my opinion, almost every trenchless or tunnel project should have a baseline report. The baseline report itself doesn't cost very much to put together. Um, it doesn't take necessarily any more geotech, geotech information than you had already obtained for the project. It's just a way, a tool, for the owner to use as a strategy for risk management. Um, within, within the baselines, the contractor's risk, and beyond the baselines, the owner's risk. Um, has the ability to address conditions and make things easy to resolve during construction. Nothing's easy to resolve during construction as far as change orders that you know, can be very expensive on tunnel projects. But if you have some rules of engagement, which the baseline report is, helps provide those rules of engagement, it makes things a lot easier and uh, avoids litigation in court, which no one wants to do. So um, different kinds of risks that can be allocated to the contractor, um, a range of conditions, the means and methods that are consistent with those conditions, you know, his quality, and, and his ability to meet cost and schedule. And we want to allocate those fairly because certain contractors won't bid jobs without a GBR, right? They, they want to make sure that it's an equitable project to begin with before they get involved in it. Um, you're going to get better, more closely spaced bids when there's less ambiguity in the conditions. Um, avoid and quickly resolve disputes. Sometimes this disputes, the cost of those claims go up because they take so long to resolve, right? If it's, if the contractor stops work and he's waiting to resolve the dispute every day, he's not working, it costs money, right? So we want to get those things resolved as quickly as possible. And then finally avoid litigation. Nobody wins except the lawyers when we go to court. Um, everyone, lawyers get paid a whole bunch and everyone else get, loses money when we go to court. So it's, it's best to keep it out of that way. There's anything we can do there. And then the final, one of the final questions here today, you know, who owns the ground? Matter what I'm going to say, the courts have said that the owner owns the ground. It's his ground, and if it's different than what it says in the contract, the contractor is going to be paid. Um, that's been litigated many times. And so no matter what we say in the contract, that it, it'll come back and it'll go back to the owner. So we have to make sure we are consistent with our baseline geotechnical reports on projects. Um, some industry standards. Um, ASCE's got a great one. The 3615 um, guidance for microtunneling. Um, Again, we talked about the, the book, basement reports, it's be few pages. Um, just like a basement report should be, should be short and brief to the point. Um, and then you know, risk management guidelines, both from the U.S. and uh, and Europe. In Europe, if you look at the word tunneling, it's spelled with two L's. In the U.S. is spelled with one L. You always tell the strong about how they spell the word tunneling. And just to close out, some cool products that are going on I wanted to share. Um, you know, Elon Musk... He's got a lot of different business practices. People love hate him. Um, he does cool stuff with his, his company called The Boring Company. Um, they built a tunnel under the uh, convention center in Las Vegas. Um, they're going to use electric vehicles based on the Model X to transport people on the south. So we deal right to the tunnel. The difference is, looks like the tunnels are 21 diameter. He's going to be using a 40 foot grid 12 inch tunnel. And that works well for moving people back and forth. Obviously, a 12-foot diameter tunnel costs a lot less than 21 foot. So it might, might provide some opportunities to reduce the cost for transportation projects for mass transit or even for pedestrian transit. You know, he's been pitching the uh, whole have your car go down an elevator shaft into a tunnel. Um, curious to see how that moves forward. In Texas, um, you know, Cap Metro and Austin's come out and said, that, hey, we want to build a look at building a uh, downtown tunnel uh, for a light rail system. So that would be... Uh, first for, for Austin, 
something to look at. Obviously, Dallas has got so it's tunnel the dark system. Um, and I build another one, uh, the D2 project downtown, downtown Dallas, a connecting subway tunnel. Uh, Houston, um, drawing tunnels, figure number four. Um, they're doing an uh, analysis of different method, methods to reduce the risk for uh, the risk of wars and mudding on the west of Houston. If you're essentially used to the uh, tunnels are one of the sweetest solutions that can be looked at there. And then also in Houston, um, wastewater. Houston has 39 wastewater facilities and hundreds stations. Um, that's not a system that is easy to operate. Uh, they want to fix all the time. Additionally, all those facilities flooded during hurricane Harvey gets damaged. Um, so look at all those core centralized facilities that are easy to operate. So tunnels allow it to be done because they can go deep, right? It's really flat. It's hard, hard to do gravity sewers, um, but this allows us to go a lot deeper. So with that, open up for questions. I do have my email and phone number on there. If there's individual questions, I'm happy to discuss this. I can talk about tunnels all day. Um, I appreciate everyone listening in today, and, and I guess I'll open it up for questions if there are any. Thank you, Brian. <coughs> you were kind of right in there, and I hope I'm coming through okay. The, there are a couple questions, and anybody that else that wants to uh, type in a question in the Q&A box, uh, now would be a good time to put those questions on. Uh, the first question, uh, uh, Brian, is, uh, so would one goal of the interjack be to more evenly distribute jacking forces along the length of the tunnel alignment? Absolutely. Um, that that is you know, the primary purpose is because it, uh, those forces grow linear, linearly as you go along. Right? The more the more side you're, you're experiencing your life in there, grow and grow and grow. And you have an estimate at the beginning of the job what it is, but um, at the end of the job it might be different. It might be different. It might, it might be more pursuing. And so the impact allows you to break that force up along the way. Well, no, if you don't see with your sound because it, it's uh, kind of crackling, breaking up. Uh, there's another question uh, that uh, was asked about the uh, the presentation slides being available, and yes, they will be. Uh, the presentation slides will be provided as well as a recording of the session to all attendees. Another question. Any experience using concrete pipe in tunneling projects? Yeah, so concrete pipe is something that you, you'll see on, on micro tunnels, um, primarily for jacking pipe. Um, you can see it sometimes as a, a, a liner for uh, a water line project, you know, PCCP or, or something else, or even on drainage projects for tunnels for an RCP. Um, on the wastewater side, fiberglass has really become kind of the, the tool of choice because of its corrosion protection. Um, but yeah, certainly PCCP, RCP, other stuff can be put in tunnels. Um, you just got to make sure you're not gonna, it's not going to experience too much water pressure um, once that tunnel is, is put in service. Another question. Generally, what percentage of underground projects in Texas use GBRs? Ooh, that's a good, that's a good, great question. Um, I don't have a, a data set, but I would say right now, uh, less than half probably are, maybe less than that. Texas is behind the curve on using GBRs projects. A lot of other countries are more standard. There's this sort of complexity or, or any kind of marginal risk on a project, I would I strongly encourage them to, to be included. And, and it's something that's coming to Texas more frequently, but it's it's lagging behind the rest of the United States. Another question. How do you put the inner jack into the pipe? It's actually, uh, it, it, so it is a part of the pipe itself. Um, it's, it's got a steel outer ring. And so after you, you take your line, you'll get dust out of the inner jack and, and it collapses, um, the rest of the pipe collapses around it. Um, again, this is another great look at Google it on YouTube. You can see a video of it. Um, so it's, in, it's installed between the pipes, the jack, and 
And then when it's done, right, the hydrogen is packed through, uh, the, the jacks come out of the inside of the inner jack station, the outside steel part stays, and then the rest of the product pipe is pushed up against itself. So it disappears into the pipeline. All right. Well, all right. That's all the questions that have been submitted so far. And uh, I want to thank all of you who have participated in today's ASE Texas section technical webinar. And a particular thanks to uh, Brian Gettinger for such an excellent presentation. You covered a lot of material and helped explain a lot of things uh, to us. Individual registrants will receive an attendance acknowledgement without any further action. And if there are any of you attending in groups in this stay at home time, the site coordinator will receive the attendance acknowledgement for distribution. And of course, we're always looking for anyone who is interested in presenting a Texas section webinar. You can contact uh, A. Salazar, that's A S A L A Z A R, at walterpmore.com for more information, or Mike Sousa. You can visit the webinars page on the ASA Texas section website for a full list of upcoming sessions, including structural inspection and condition assessment for critical infrastructure assets, which will be on May 12th, our next one. We're always uh, available uh, for your questions and hope to hear from you soon. I'll turn it back over to Mike to end the session. All right, everybody, thank you for attending today. And I know there was some connection issues during the Q&A, so we will try to get the speaker to answer those via email, and uh, I'll send those out with the follow-up email. Uh, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.